Hello, everyone. Uh, we're really glad to be here. Um, so our talk today is about how small can you go? And this is in the context of customizing interpreted languages uh, for WebAssembly. And so if we uh, talk about the RAS report that we have on the state of WASM as of 2022, uh, we see that uh, we have uh, a lot of users that are interested or are already using serverless or containerized environments. And for example, they are also using WebAssembly as a plugin environment. But also more than that, if we look at the evolution from 2021 to 2022, we see that serverless and containerization, everything is, uh, and, and as a plugin environment especially, is, is, everything is, is growing a lot. And so we ask or we wonder, um, is there anything we can do to help this community? Is there, any, is there anything we can do to help WebAssembly and also the people who actually want to try WebAssembly and the, see the benefits of WebAssembly? And the answer with interpreted languages is that they have an, a huge existing user base. And so we want to take advantage of that. We want, to, we want them to see that WebAssembly has multiple benefits. We have seen today like multiple times uh, in terms of security, in terms of, port in terms of portability, on, of composability. And so we want them to, to come to WebAssembly. And in, at the same time, we want, web, we want WebAssembly to have more users. And so we want them to come with their ecosystem, right, and, and reach WebAssembly uh, completely. And the, and, the, and the question there is how do we bring them to WebAssembly? Do we just lift and ship their applications? Will just that work? Like when we add virtual machines, we move to containers, kind of a lift and ship kind of move. Uh, is this something that we can actually pull? Um, does it really make sense? And so the target for interpreted languages is a little, a li a little bit different. And so in this case, because we are talking, in this talk we are focusing on size, we are trying to make our interpreters smaller. And this, this is, the reason that we are trying to do this is because when you move to the edge or closer to the edge, I don't have a really good definition of edge, but what I can understand or my, my guts tell me is that you know, it's a more heterogeneous environment. It's usually smaller in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, what it can compute. And so we want things to be smaller. We want things to uh, speed up faster. And so the first thing that we want to do in terms of size is to reduce external dependencies on the interpreters. And so for that, uh, the Wasm Labs team, uh, we created the Wasm Language Runtimes project that uh, other companies are using today or are contributing to it. And so we have created uh, or we have uh, published uh, Ruby, Python, and PHP um, so you can just use those interpreters, run your, program, run your programs in those languages, and just use them. But as part of this work, and because we want these people that are using interpreted languages to come to WebAssembly without having to do a lot of other work, um, we want things to just work out of the box, right? Uh, so we had to all support a lot of different libraries. This is a work in progress, and the, the, the job is not done. Of course, it's not finished, um, but we needed, for example, to board libraries as the ones that you see here, and more will come, of course. By the way, uh, if you want to contribute, you have the door open, so uh, come and contribute to this project. And so these libraries is not only to support these languages. Uh, in this project, we also want other people to use these libraries as third-party libraries. So if you need Settledeep, you know where to go. You get Settledeep, and then you use uh, Settledeep from there. So that's in terms of the interpreter. We just made the interpreter smaller, and so this is what we can do with the interpreter itself. But there is another moving piece, that is uh, the, the um, standard library. And so, yeah, one second. So there is, the, there is a standard library that we can also reduce. And so, for example, with Python, you are able to reduce the standard library in two ways, mainly. One is uh, I, can, I can zip the standard library, and then the interpreter is going to unzip it on the fly, and then it's going to read that interpreter, it's going to read that standard library, or you can strip and unused features from it. And so what we saw from the standard library of Python, uh, this is just from, from, from the standard library itself, you see that the unit test, for example, takes a lot of space. This is something we didn't uh, really experiment with uh, on the WebAssembly language runtimes yet. But for example, if you remove this, uh, you are stripping almost two megs out of it uh, straight away. And so this is something that we uh, wanted to check as well. So 
if we go to the interpreter again, uh, we were talking about having this slim version that you can just run closer to the user so it's uh, something less powerful that can run it. And so for this, we have the slim and the batteries included versions. Uh, slim is like ab around 5 megs for PHP CGI. Batteries included versions are, are around 13 megs. Uh, but what happens if I need something in the middle? Because I want things to just run out of the box. I don't have, I don't need a lot of things. Uh, I just need what I need, right? So for example, in this case, I just built uh, with this project, with web and language, language runtimes, a version that just built XML and SQLite that is around 10 megs. And so you are able to make your own. So we have all this um, pipe work, let's say, that you can just use. And you can configure and build your own interpreter. And you can even optimize it as you want. So basically, you have the door open to do whatever you need in terms of uh, optimizing your interpreter on the standard library. And so the last part of this is, OK, I need to embed everything into a single piece of software. And then you need to bundle three things. Mainly, that's the interpreter, that's the standard library. If it applies, for example, in PHP, there is no standard library that goes uh, next to the interpreter. Everything is bundled into the interpreter. And then your application, that is what is going actually going to serve the user. And so for this, you have different options. Oscar is going to look more into that and is going to give you uh, more hints on how to do that. But you have like manual pre-opens where you have the source code uh, next to your module. You just open that, and then it runs. You could also use Docker plus Wasm, uh, where you just build a container, and then you run that uh, right away. Or you could use WASIVFS. Uh, this is a project that has been mentioned before. Uh, you need to have uh, WASI builds for it. Uh, but in this case, on WebAssembly language runtimes, we are using WASI for all our builds. And it's a virtual file system where you can just uh, put that together um, with your stat statically linked with your program. And so you can refer to uh, files on this virtual file system and load them. OK, so one thing that we did for this uh, talk was, OK, let's try to compress with WASIVFS. So this is a feature that is not supported on WASIVFS as of today. And so it's like, what if we are able to compress? So when you do WASIVFS, there is like two things. One is the guest part, which is the static library that you uh, link together with the program. And then was the WASIVFS pack CLI that you call from your host, xlc 64 if you want, for example. And then it will just go and read like all the things that you want to mount inside of the WebAssembly module. And it gets bundled, bundled together into the WebAssembly binary itself. So let's look for a quick demo on this one. Uh, this is not yet open. Uh, there is no pull request open for this. Uh, but uh, we are going to, to open that soon. And so, for example, we have a very simple main C program uh, that is just going to f open TMT, TMP test file, and then it's going to read every character and it's going to print every character that, that it finds. The cool thing about this is that with the compress option, as you can see, there is nothing uh, that this program knows about Xset. Uh, this implementation that, that we created uses Xset, so we have, we have to also support lib LZMA in order for this to work. Uh, this is completely transparent to you. Uh, you just open and you just read. And the thing is that when you do WASIBFS minus C with compress, it will do on the CLI side compress everything and pre-open everything compressed with Xset. And then the guest part of it will automatically decompress uh, when it reads or when you read from the module. Um, it can be optimized a lot, because right now it, it, it doesn't even implement a cursor. So every time you kind of read, it decompresses the whole thing. So it's very, it's very slow right now. But the idea is that it, will, it will, be, will optimize it. So this is a test file that I just created for this example. And now I have another file that is bigger. It's ASCII test, so it, it's, it has a very high compressed ratio. And so uh, we have the test file here and a big text ASCII text file. And then what I'm going to do here is to, bra uh, to package a regular WASI DFS version of our module without compress. So the first command that you can see here is just going to build our program, the main C file that you can see here. It's also going to link lib WASI DFS, the guest site, along with it. And then it's going to output that to main WASM and uh, TMP. And then we have the target WASM32 WASI. So this works as expected. And now I can do the very same thing, uh, but with compress option. And in this case, you can see I can uh, skip the part where I build the main C file. And now I can just do minus C, and then it just finished. And now I, we can compare both files, one without compress and one with compress. And you can see it's left than half the size, uh, because it had a really uh, high compress ratio, so it's 
uh, pretty easy uh, for that to, to work that way. And now we can just brand the compressed version out of it. Okay, um, so this is just an example of a very simple text file, but for example, if you create a WASI uh, program that contains everything embedded with WASI BFS, and for example, you embed WordPress in it, you will see that there are really, really high compressed radius, like we are talking about 29 megs instead of 71, for example, right? So it's like a uh, very big compressed radius that we can just pull uh, without having to worry about lots of things. Okay, and with that, um, Oscar is going to talk more about the details of other options. All right, um, so that's one side of the coin, right? Where it's like, okay, how small can we get the interpreter itself, like the actual WebAssembly module that we need to run? Um, but the other side of that is, what if we can actually take the source code that the user wants to run and provide that at runtime? Um, if we can do that, essentially, you know, in this, especially in this component model kind of world, we can essentially link in that code at runtime and only move that bit over, and then that's going to be quite a bit smaller. Um, so that's the huge thing, is just having the interpreter ready to go. That also is going to help out a lot with speed and performance, because a lot of the computation time is actually, hey, we have to compile that huge interpreter uh, and get it up and running. Um, now, the easiest way to do this is just via WASI. Um, and there's sort of two main approaches you can do that. Uh, one is via pre-opens. So essentially, um, you have your interpreter running, um, and when you run that interpreter, you just say, hey, I'm going to pre-open this directory that has the user's code in it that I want to run. Um, and so it's actually pretty simple to do this. Um, and in a language like Python that just loves that disk, uh, this solution actually works really, really well. Um, because essentially, hey, yeah, just mount the directory. It works kind of just the same way you run Python on your computer. Um, there can be some downsides with this approach where it can be a little bit brittle. Um, because in this approach, it's like it's not the situation of, hey, I just compiled like a Rust module, for example, where the only thing I need to care about when I run that thing is that Rust module. I don't need to care about additional files. But when going to a system like this, all of a sudden, now when I want to run that user's program, I got to make sure I have that WASM file ready to go, and I got to make sure that I've got their source code somewhere that I can actually preload it. Um, or pre-open it so that way the system can read it. Um, so depending on how you architect your system, that could be a little bit brittle. Um, now ways around this, and this is, for example, at Suborbital, how we do this today is we just bundle all the code in uh, with the interpreter itself, have one WASM module, and it's not a problem. Um, but uh, there are other ways around this uh, as well. The other major way is via standard in. Um, so it's like, hey, I don't want to deal with the files at all. I actually just have some source code that I want to run. Um, and this uh, sort of thing works really well with a language like JavaScript, um, because essentially all JavaScript bundlers do anyway is take a bunch of JavaScript code and just concatenate it all together. So that actually works really well here because, hey, I can just stream that in over standard in, the interpreter can read it and run it, and hey, I didn't have to deal with any files, and I'm a happy camper. Um, so one downside of this approach is what if you want your, uh, your user's code to be able to use standard in and standard out? That could potentially be a problem because you're taking it away to be able to do this exact thing. But depending on how you architect your system, you can restore it. There's you know, solutions here like, hey, actually, let's just use a different file descriptor. There are some easy ways around that. Now, where things get really interesting is doing it via module linking. So this goes back to, hey, actually, I just want to deal with WebAssembly modules. I don't want to deal with source code files. I don't want to stream source code over standard in. I really just want a WebAssembly module. So our system at Suborbital really likes WebAssembly modules. It doesn't really like other types of files, and I don't want to have to get the team to <laughs> re-architect everything to make it work by bringing uh, source files along. So by packaging up user source into its own WebAssembly module and linking that in at runtime solves a million issues here. Um, and in some cases, we can even pre-compile bytecode, right? So instead of saying, hey, actually, this is just a WebAssembly module that wraps some text, uh, potentially for whatever interpreter you're using, it has some sort of bytecode format that it uses. You can pre-compile that to whatever bytecode format, and then when you link it in at runtime, it's even faster because it's already completely ready to go. The interpreter doesn't have to do that extra work to get it working. So 
the cool thing about that is you get exceptionally small binaries, uh, especially like if you're not even dealing with generating bytecode, the size of your WASM module is only, you know, just a hair bigger than the size of whatever your source code was. Um, and so then we go from having to deal with this 26 megabyte Python WebAssembly module to this, oh, little baby, you know, 300 bytes WebAssembly module, and that's a lot easier to move around the system. So I want to show you guys um, some code on how if you are using an interpreter, uh, this is how uh, you sort of make it work. Uh, a lot of this code is being pulled directly from the WebAssembly language runtimes repo. Um, and so in here, the major way you make this work is you have a couple of exports uh, for your interpreter that the WebAssembly module itself is going to expose. So the main thing you need is how can I allocate memory so I can feed in that source code? Uh, and we do that via uh, this allocate string function. Um, then the next is how do I execute that user source code? We do that via exec string. And then, of course, every interpreter needs to do some initialization, so we provide a uh, way to do that as well. So these functions are dead simple to implement, um, and it's really easy for anyone to do. Don't feel that, hey, this is too complicated for me to get this working. You have to write this code one time. Um, in the sense, each of these are just a single line of code. Um, so for initialize, it's okay. Just tell the interpreter, hey, I'll just do whatever you gotta do to get ready. That's pretty easy. Um, allocating a string, uh, it's just a matter of, in this case, uh, we wanna have a null terminated string. I was lazy. I just used calic for this and added one to it, um, which, you know, in production, you can write code that's slightly better, but this totally works for here. Um, and then in terms of actually doing the execution, um, that's it. You just say, hey, whatever method, um, and I'll show you that as well, whatever method by which your interpreter does that, just tell it, hey, yeah, just execute the string. Um, in this case, it's literally a matter of, for Python anyway, of saying, hey, Python, compile this string. Um, and it's just like, all right, <laughs> I did it, here you go. Um, and then the next is, hey, now I want you to execute that code. Um, and that's it. And this is all of the code that is necessary, really, to get this working. Um, you don't need anything more complicated than that. Um, so, how do you actually get the code uh, that the user wrote into a WebAssembly module? I promise you that it's so dang easy, you could write that WebAssembly module by hand. And so what I did was I wrote that WebAssembly module by hand uh, because it's really that easy. Um, so it's a matter of on line six, and this is the program that we wanna run. Uh, it's just print hello world. That's pretty easy. Uh, line seven is just, what's the size of the data? It's 21 bytes. Um, line eight does the actual loading into memory, um, but that's just like a couple of WebAssembly instructions. And then the big piece here is just the start function. So what the start function does is it'll say, hey, let me allocate a string for this data, sets it into a local. Then after that, we load that uh, data in um, and that's uh, calling the function that we define on line eight, which just literally writes that data into memory. And then on line 19, we just say, all right, interpreter, execute that. That's how dead simple it is to put something like this together. Um, so in fact, uh, in terms of the quote unquote tool that you need to actually take source code and put it in a WebAssembly module, I actually just wrote a bash script um, because you don't need anything more complicated than that. You can, of course, like, you know, do it properly, you know, break out some rust, you know, as we all like to do. But sometimes it's literally a matter of write a bash script that writes this uh, Watt file out and then just use something like Watt to Wasm to just switch it into WebAssembly and then you can get the stuff running. Um, so with that, I swear I know how to run my own demo, I swear. Um, so with that, I'm gonna show you how easy it is to actually uh, get this up and running. Sweet. Um, so uh, the Python code that we're gonna wanna bundle into a module is right here. It's super simple, it's literally a hello world file, nothing special there. Um, but we need to actually build that uh, module. Like I said, I literally made a bash script all it does is it takes the code um, from the file, puts it into that Watt file, writes it to disk, and then runs Watt to Wasm on it. It's super simple, um, and so that's it. And then the next question is, of course, how do you actually run that? Um, this is possible literally with Wasm time. You don't need to do anything special. Um, so the way this works here is Wasm time has this flag called dash dash preload, and you just tell it, 
hey, um, here is the interpreter. It is here. It is ready. Um, and you give it a name. In this case, they call it uh, Python provider. Um, and here's that WebAssembly module. So just preload this and then execute my WebAssembly module that I gave you. Uh, and if we do that, it runs and it's actually pretty quick. Uh, it says, you know, we get our hello uh, wasm day running in Python uh, and it was linked from two separate WebAssembly modules. Now, the sweet part about that is in my system, I can have that Python provider WebAssembly module already running. I can already have it cached like to hell, just waiting ready at the edge. And then I have this 300 megabyte WebAssembly file that I'm shipping. And boy, can I get that over the network quick. Uh, and that makes me pretty happy than shipping this 26 megabyte WebAssembly file. Um, so overall, it's an actual real way to make this happen. And in fact, if you use uh, Javi and you use the uh, linking flag for that, it does the exact same thing. And so this is an easy general approach you can use for your interpreted languages running in WebAssembly. Um, so with that, how can we make the experience with interpreters better overall? Well, we have a lot of WASI proposals coming up for things like, oh, databases and HTTP, one of the things that exists um, as a Python standard library is a full-fledged uh, HTTP client. And imagine uh, there was a way that we didn't have to ship that, because uh, I'm sure that takes up probably like one, two, maybe even three megabytes uh, in our interpreter, right? Well, the beauty of that is we can maybe get that working via WASI and via the component model. Because with the new proposals coming up in WASI, we can start replacing a lot of the functionality in our interpreters with native support that exists in WASI. Um, and that's going to be able to get us um, our interpreter binary sizes way, way down because we're essentially just removing so much handwritten functionality that just doesn't need to be there when we can reprovide it. Um, and that's going to be the, the, the big piece uh, that gets it all working and gets those interpreters even smaller. Um, and that's about it, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation, um, Oscar and Rafael. Um, we have uh, time for, uh, for a few questions. Yes. I don't think you need the introduction, but. Hey, I'm Bailey. Uh, so I'm curious, how much of this do you think can land in the upstream languages, like for Python and PHP? Yep. Thank you for the question. That's uh, that's a great one. So, uh, for example, in the case of WebAssembly language runtimes, we are uh, maintaining the PHP paths uh, because it's uh, kind of a big path. Um, and what we are doing is uh, contributing to the upstream. And so we are we are seeing uh, when the community is going to uh, give that like a green light, and it's going to to get into into there. But uh, we don't know much about uh, when is that going to happen. Or yeah, but we are trying to upstream everything we do uh, in that case. So. Uh, one of the things I'll add to that is uh, the work that Raphael did on uh, WASI VFS uh, with Compress. Um, he told me he was going to get a PR up for that <laughs> pretty soon. Um, and so that would be, you know, available because that's obviously a tool that a lot of us use and just having the ability to just hit a compile flag um, and say like, hey man, like just compress this for me and it just works like with no effort required is amazing. So I believe <laughs> that's going to be up pretty soon and is, with is. tests too, maybe. <laughs> uh, and, and that should be upstream pretty soon. Any other questions? OK, thank you very much. Um, please give a round of applause to, to Rafael and Oscar. Thank you, everyone.